Okay, so I just want to quickly, before I start talking about DeckGL, talk a bit about GPUs and CPUs um, and where the kind of whole industry is going. So in the last 10 years, CPUs haven't really got much faster. We've hit like a physical limit of how much we can do, how fast we can make the move. Um, but GPUs have got faster, not because they're running more quickly, but because we have more cores. They're kind of going wider rather than going faster. And if you look at the latest set of chips from Apple, which are these ones in the corner, um, then as you go through them, you're not actually getting a faster processor, you're just getting more and more GPUs. So when it comes to doing rendering on a computer, um, often the way you sort of process some data for data visualization is you need to download the data, process it, um, then do some filtering or computation, and then draw it. The common way of thinking about doing this is you do the first three of these things on the CPU, and then you pump this data to the GPU to draw it. Um, and what I want to try and convince you today is that you can actually get some really cool results if you move some of this filtering and computing to the GPU, because this is your processor which is kind of really uh, getting faster and faster and faster and has a huge amount of, of power. Let me just see if I can try and make this work now. Yay. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of DeckGL first and then talk about three extensions, um, two of which are completely new this year. So who of you here knows what DeckGL is vaguely? Okay, half, so I'll go reasonably quickly. Um, so just quickly to recap, DeckGL is a JavaScript library which lets you do data visualization on top of uh, different base maps. So it's purely the visualization layer, not so much the map that you see underneath. We have a rich collection of layers which lets you visualize data from lots and lots of different data sources. We use the GPU to accelerate. And if you haven't checked out our website in a while, then you really should. We've made it much better. It's much easier to navigate the documentation. We have a really nice search bar, you can just sort of type and it finds all the things that you need to do. Um, I would also want to point out that my colleague from Carto, Alberto, is doing a more kind of introductory talk, paradoxically right after this one, um, but that's gonna be in the other building in, I forgot what's the room called, the Drini room. One question I get very often with DeckGL is like, what's the difference between DeckGL and something like a Mapbox or MapLibra? Um, the difference is that MapLibre is your base map and DeckGL is drawn on top. So you can build an application using DeckGL and if you want to swap out your library for drawing the maps, so you want to swap from say Mapbox to MapLibre or to Google Maps or to Leaflet, then you can swap that layer out and the application works as before. All your kind of visualization layers are going to work like you had before. But on certain libraries, we actually go even further than this, and we can draw directly into the world of the, of the map. So with Google Maps, where you have like 3D buildings when you zoom into a city, we can actually place objects directly into that 3D space. And as you kind of move a building around, we have like scatter points or 3D objects within that scene. So the integration is, is very seamless. Uh, the uh, API of DeckGL is pretty simple. Uh, at the high level, you're essentially taking some kind of data, so in this case, a JSON document, which is a list of coordinates and some properties, and you map this using what's called a layer to the screen. So here, I specify that I want my data to come from airports.json, and I tell DeckGL that my coordinates should go um, from the coordinates parameter, and the fill color should come from uh, the type. So here I'm going to draw red if it's a major city and um, black, although I think it's blue and like black if it's not. And if you want to check out these slides later, they're linked from the talk page and all of these kind of demonstrations I have here have got like a live code example so you can play around with them. Okay, so that's like an um, introduction to DeckGL in, in two minutes. Here's just a couple of the layers that we have that you can use on the website. So you can see it's quite varied. Some of them are more kind of like data vis style things, so like kind of uh, lines and polygons on a map, but we also have like a 3D layer, one of a point cloud. We can do a lot of sort of different things. Okay, so what is a layer extension, which is kind of the whole point of this talk? 
In DeckGL, we organize um, the visualizations with layers, and these are just classes in JavaScript. So if you have one of the core layers and you want to extend it in some way, um, you can subclass that layer and change it. So for example, for a scatter plot, if instead of drawing circles, I want to draw triangles, I can make my own custom layer and it's gonna, it's gonna work. But if you wanna have a more general approach to extending layers, you can use something called a layer extension, which is like a plugin that you put on top of any layer and it gives any layer kind of a new functionality. So again, you can write these yourself and the simple cases are reasonably simple, like this sort of, let's change a circle for a triangle. Um, but what is really nice about these extensions is that DeckGL comes with a couple of uh, sort of predefined extensions, which are actually very powerful. They add a bunch of new features to, in most cases, all of the layers, which lets you do things um, that you couldn't do um, as easily in JavaScript. So I'm just quickly gonna go over the layer API so you get an idea of how you would do this in code. Um, this is using something called a data filter extension, which does what you'd expect. It filters your data. Um, and the way I would add this to a layer is that I would specify that I want this extension. I tell DeckGL that when I'm gonna use this extension, the filter value that I'm filtering by is time. So in GeoJSON, each feature is gonna have some properties and one of them is gonna be time. And then I specify a filter range, just here it's like in seconds for a, an entire day. And then what this lets me do is to make a visualization like this, where if you can see on the bottom of the screen, then as I move these two points, I'm changing that filter range. Um, and I can even click the play button to scrub through this data. But the really powerful thing here is actually what's happening underneath the covers. All this filtering is happening on the GPU. So on every frame, there's basically no JavaScript code running. Like the CPU is gonna be completely idle. And it's only when the GPU comes to draw these points, it's checking, are they within my filter range? And then it's hiding and showing them. So that's why you can animate tens of thousands of points like this on a web page, and it's not gonna get slow. Okay, so on to the first of the extensions I want to talk about. Uh, it's an extension called a collision filter extension, which basically lets you hide points or features on your map so that they don't collide with each other. So here I'm using them to add a label layer to a road network in Mexico, but saying I don't want them to collide with each other as I rotate and tilt the map. Here's another example with, I think, 7,000 cities across the whole world. And it's showing how now, if I turn the filtering off, this is what it would look like. As I zoom in, I can see the cities, but when I'm zoomed out, it becomes like a mess. And if I have the filtering on, then as I zoom in, it's kind of uh, automatically popping in and out uh, all of these points for me. One of the things that's really nice about doing this on the GPU is that it's gonna work with uh, tiled data. So a lot of web maps now, you're loading bits by tiles. As you're gonna zoom in, you're gonna get more data. And trying to do like collision avoidance on data coming from different sources as the map is changing and rotating is basically impossible to do in JavaScript. You couldn't do that in real time. So how hard is this to implement on your application? It's actually very easy. You just add one line of code to the extensions, you add the collision filter extension, and it will just automatically on any layer, do this collision avoidance for you. And can you specify on the, one of the property from the GeoJSON, say, give prior, more priority to points that have mm -hmm. such uh, filtering? We have an optional parameter called a get a collision priority. But yes, good question, well preempted. So you basically just specify one of the priorities which is gonna return some kind of number. Um, so then this previous example that I had, it was prioritizing the cities with a high population over those with a low one, but it can be anything. Yeah. Um, and you can also tweak the way the collision avoidance works by supplying these uh, collision test props. So you can kind of give a larger buffer around each point. So it's not just like only if the two points touch, it can be like as if they were a bit bigger so you can give a bit more space. Yeah. And this code is running on every single frame. Like, it's, it's basically so fast, this filtering is kind of like zero cost. Like, you wouldn't notice turning it on or off. Uh, a really nice use case for this is uh, labeling. 
So this gets a little bit more complex because you have to anchor um, the labels to like a different point. But I basically uh, use this filter extension to build this kind of labeling layer where essentially I create what looks like a normal text layer. Um, say I want these points to hide. And as you move around the map and as you tilt it, and that's actually something that's quite hard to do calculating uh, the collisions when you're tilting the map, um, they nicely uh, zoom, um, sorry, fade in and fade out. Uh, the next uh, extension is one called the mask extension. So if you've used something uh, like Photoshop for image editing, there's often the concept there of having one layer as a mask. So you could have like a star or something, a black and white star, and another that's like an image of say your dog, and you want to have like a star shape with your dog in it. And you say, I want to use this image to mask this one. So this is exactly the same idea, but it's in um, the geospatial sphere. So here my mask is one deck GL layer, which is then gonna mask another layer. So it's not gonna be in the screen space, it's gonna be like, say, a region of a city. And because this masking is happening on the GPU, we can change this layer on every frame. Um, and here we've used it to make like a lasso tool where you draw a region on the map and as you move it, it's gonna change the features uh, that you have there. Uh, I think I just basically went over this. There's just one subtlety um, to how you do the masking. So if you have um, points on the map, then you might want to not mask like a point that would be in the corner of your mask, but you might want to show the whole object. So you can even mask by the object as a whole, or you can clip it as if you were doing it in, in Photoshop. Uh, the API, again, is reasonably simple. Um, a bit more complicated than the collision filter because you now need to have two layers. One, which is your mask layer. So here I've defined the shape of Italy to be my mask. And then the other one is all of the airports in the world. Um, and then when I add the mask extension and tell DeckGL that the mask ID that I'm interested in is the layer at the top, I'm basically gonna get a visualization which shows me all of the airports in Italy. So in effect, what I'm doing here is a spatial join, but it's being done on the GPU. Um, and because it's being done there, then you can just quickly change here. It's basically an example we have on our website where you have a lot of cities. And as you click different time zones, then it's just gonna show you the cities um, that are in that time zone. Uh, I think I already had the slide. So this is talking about where you're either masking by the instance or you're masking, um, like clipping the region. And I just have two uh, visualizations of this. So this one is a visualization of flights in the USA where I can click on a state and it's gonna show me the flight paths that start from that state and go to another state. Um, and the really nice thing about this is that these lines are not getting clipped to the state itself, but the entire object is remaining. So the, the arcs are being masked by instance, um, but the map that I have, uh, the base map, like the simple roads and cities you can I just get, uh, you can see when I select the state, they are being masked, uh, they're not being masked by instance, sorry. So those get clipped to the edge of the state. Um, yep. And the, the mask extension supports up to four masks. So you can basically independently have like up to four layers which are acting as masks for four other layers. So here I can sort of select in parallel one state to mask the flights and another one to mask uh, the airports with buffers around them. And again, this is all on the GPU, so it's basically not gonna slow down the visualization, visualization at all. I can now go back to one of the visualizations I had earlier. You might have noticed and might have been thinking, what was that with the, the flights flying and everything flashing? It was basically showing flights going over cities and highlighting cities that had a plane flying over them within the last hour or something like that. And the way that I did that is I had a cities layer and a planes layer, so far so simple. And then I have an invisible layer, which is the trail behind a plane. And I use this as a mask for the highlight layer. And this is all happening in real time. Um, and it lets me basically show all of the flight data in the world and all of the major cities. Um, and it runs at 
120, second, uh, 120 frames per second in the browser. Okay, last extension, um, and this one's quite cool. I think I will show you a quick demo if uh, internet permits. Um, this is a demo that we worked on with Google this year who released all of the data that they have in um, Google Earth. And it can now be loaded into DEC um, at the same resolution as you're using uh, in Google Earth. But that was only one part of what you could do or what we implemented this year. Another part was the ability to add a 3D overlay on top of this tile data um, using the terrain extension. So that extension essentially lets you take another layer and glue it on top another layer which has got some kind of 3D uh, terrain to it. And that's actually really useful because if you don't have this, then your problem is that you have a 3D tile layer and your visualization is somewhere underground. You can't see it. So this essentially lets you do a visualization like you would in, in something like Cesium, um, but in, in DeckGL. And actually, DeckGL is one of the two supported renderers that Google recommend uh, for their 3D tiles. So it's something that we're pretty excited about because I think it's really cool that now there's two open source libraries that can basically render the world in, in this kind of detail. So this is, this is like all live. If I want to kind of move around with this, then it works like this. If you want to check out this application, it's fully open source. Um, it's at 3dtiles.carto.com. Okay, now I just need to find my presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think I just talked about this. Um, basically, we have a 3D tile layer in deck, which loads in 3D tiles, as you'd expect. Uh, it newly supports the photorealistic 3D tiles from Google and it now works with the terrain extension. Um, it's a very similar API to what you would have with um, the mask layer, where you specify one layer as your terrain source. So this is gonna be my tile 3D layer. Um, and another layer is your data visualization source. So here I'm just using GeoJSON, and I just say um, that I wanna have an extension of the terrain, and this layer then automatically get glued on top of my uh, tile 3D layer. Okay, so I would return to my question from before, which is, is the GPU on your computer idle? Like, if your visualization is running slow, then maybe the reason is because you're not actually using the most powerful processor in your computer. Um, so, that's your case. I would say give DeckGL a try. And um, before I finish, I would say we're an open source project. There's basically two main maintainers, Xiaoji and me, um, and we've had a quite a bump in usage in the last two years. I think we've gone from 50,000 to 200,000 uh, weekly downloads, which is great. But we don't have as many people around to fix things. So if this sounds interesting to you, then please get in touch. Um, we're always looking for contributors. Um, and I'll just give a quick shout out to my company that sent me here, Carto. If you feel like your current job is like being stuck in a dungeon, then give us a try and uh, come and talk to me. And yeah. That is everything, so thank you.